Welcome back, Venable Rubina. Hello. All right. Good, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good, everyone. It's got dark. Good, good. Huh? It's, it's got it's dark where you are. It is dark. Here's yeah. light. I've got the light. I've got a light on, is that right? Yes, yeah, dark out there. All my lights are on. Can you see me okay? Yes. yes. Eight o'clock. It's not dark yet. Uh, Venerable Rabina, thank you for your suggestion about having groups. We just wanted to let everybody know that during the break tomorrow, we will set up some breakout rooms and then those that want to have discussion in the break can have discussion. Good. Wonderful. Very happy. Okay. You know, so you know how to do it. That's really good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, brilliant. All right. So, okay, let's go then. Carry on. So we are looking at the Buddhist view of the universe, we're looking at what causes happiness and what causes suffering, and we're looking at this very first level of Buddhist practice, which is the first step in stopping suffering, which is another way of saying how to be happy. You know? So Buddha's view is that everything, like we said, every millisecond of what any sentient being thinks or does or says or feels or experiences, leaves kind of, it's, it's a very elaborate, sophisticated process of, of um, programming the mind. I think Buddha would have liked that phrase, programming the mind, okay? Because <clears throat> nothing goes astray. Everything's, I mean, the mind, it works in two ways. One way the mind works is a bit like Lama Zopa said, it's like we're shooting, we're, we're taking photos all day. So everything nearly is stored as memories, images, sounds, smells, tastes, everything's nearly stored as memories, which is why in the long term, the Buddha's view about the mind is that we can develop clairvoyance, which is we can access those memories. As we get more sophisticated in our practice, we can access those memories. If we get single point of concentration, one of the clear results of single point of concentration, this brilliant technique Indians invented 3000 years ago, is that you get, you, you, that because you've accessed a subtle level of your mind, you can access those memories and you can access other people's minds. That's clairvoyance is a very serious thing in Buddhism that we naturally develop as we progress. So the other thing is, that the other way the mind works is that because nothing goes astray, <clears throat> because we're reacting and acting in relation to things all the time, we're, we're doing this dynamic process of sowing seeds in the mind. And then we sow negative seeds if the actions, we, the things we think and do and say are driven by a negative state of mind. And we, we sow positive seeds in the mind if, we, if our actions and thoughts and actions and a body and speech are, are so-called virtuous. And the virtuous ones will ripen as happiness and the non-virtuous ones will ripen as suffering. So it's a pretty kind of straightforward presentation, you know? And it's quite kind of technical. It's like second by second by second. This is a process. This is naturally happening. No one's doing it to us. It's not punishment. It's not reward. It's got nothing to do with being found out or being seen to do anything. It's just this natural law, which is why, you know, the Buddha's view is we need to understand our mind. We need to understand this law of karma so we can start to be in charge of our own happiness and our own suffering. So, you know, we all know we want happiness and we all know we don't want suffering. But the Buddha's basically saying we're up, you know, kind of we've lost, we don't, we don't have the proper method. That's his view. He's not, you know, he's not being negative. So, <clears throat> of course, you can't prove this immediately. It's quite subtle. I mean, who can even prove, you know, initially on the face of it, we can't even think of a, how anything in the future is going to happen. We just tend to think it's all potluck. But no, Buddha says it's all part of this logical process. And we, it's up to us to learn these rules and laws, laws, natural laws, and attempt to live according to them. So in other words, every moment, every second, this, every second that you have an experience that you'd label happiness. In other words, speaking very simply, at the simplest level, at the simplest level, when the good things happen. Every second someone's nice to you. Every second you feel comfortable. Every second you get a nice thing. Every second the weather's pleasant and you know, is, is the, the weather's pleasant on your body. Every second the sounds are pleasant. Every, every second what you call pleasing. At the simplest level, each of those is the fruit of a virtuous seed planted in your mind by doing actions in the past. And we're doing actions every millisecond. We're just not aware, that's all. So is it, if this is so, in the same way that if it's so, that every single tiny seed that falls into a garden will just naturally ripen as a type of a, a result of tree, a fruit or whatever, then if you really, you know, you know you want a decent garden in the future, you don't wait for the future for it to happen. You've got to sow the right seeds now. And that's the whole attitude. That's the whole approach, you know. So part of our problem here is because, you know, we want happiness now. And, it, and we want happiness now, you know, right? 
So it's like you look outside and there's no garden out, there's no fruits and veggies, and you go, I want a nice garden now. Well, you know it's not possible. You didn't plant the seeds. It's not possible. And it takes time. So, but, if, but we, because we have no view of karma, because we think mummy and daddy made us or God made us or whatever, and I'm not being rude, you know, so we think, you know, then we think, well, what makes me happy? When we eat the cake, it triggers a good feeling. So we make the logical deduction that cake must be the cause of happiness. And this is a very interesting and very nuanced point, actually. Now we're going over to high school to have a look at this because it's quite technical the way they describe it. And it's really necessary for, to under, for us to understand this so we can properly interpret our experiences and know what to do with them. You know, it's quite technical. So we look at the mind now, go to high school, we go to the next level. We have to understand, you know, if it's true that a suffering comes from an action that's triggered by a negative state of mind, we better know what a negative state of mind is. And if happiness is an experience that's triggered by an action that's driven by a positive state of mind, we better know what they are. So we need to learn Buddhist psychology. So let's look simply at that. And again, this is quite unique to the Buddha. It's quite a specific model. So, We've got, we've got the sensory consciousness and we have mental consciousness. So part of our problem is, as Lama Zopa puts it, we, oh, Lama Yeshi, we make the body the boss. We are very driven by our sensory experiences because if you think about it, that's what we define as happiness and suffering. If you've got a pain in your knee, you'll call it suffering. If you know you've got a pleasant experience in your body because the sun is pleasing on it, then you call it happiness. So we're very addicted to our physical experiences. We make the body the boss. So in, from the Buddhist perspective, we give way too much power and this is not meant to be in a punitive negative sense, but in a very literal sense. We really have no real clarity about the distinction between mental states and, and sensory states of mind. And because we're mainly addicted to this body being the person I am, so this big lump of me, this body, this person. So that happiness is when you have a pleasant sensory experience and suffering is when you have an unpleasant one. And that's really what we mean by happiness, quite literally, which is why we think the outside world is the cause of our happiness. The outside world is physical matter, sound, smell, taste, touch, people, things. So they trigger feelings in this, with our sensory consciousness. Well, Buddha says this is, is completely kind of narrow-minded way of seeing it, you know? So then what, let's just even look at then what is happiness and what is suffering? Well, when you look at the mind, the Buddhist view, you can divide, you know, the contents into three categories. We've got positive states of mind, negative ones, and, and one that they call neutral, which sounds a bit misleading to us, but what I like to call these the mechanics of our mind. And there's these three categories, and the, and the Buddhist view is very precise, you know. We have thousands of different distinct states of mind. Right now, we can't tell one bit from another. It's like a big soup of emotion in there. And we, you know, we have all these different models in the West, so it's really hard to get any kind of agreement. The Buddhist view is very specific, and it's been around for two and a half thousand years, and he got it from the Hindus before him, and it hasn't changed much since then, you know. So we've got the so we've got so-called negative states of mind. And this is why, we, this is why it's, as we said in the very beginning, if we can become a Buddha and a Buddha is a person who's rid the mind of all the negative ones and developed all the positive ones, it's very obvious, it's very evident that Buddhist practice comes down to knowing how to distinguish between the negative and the positive. It's a, it's a, it's a fundamentally necessary job, you know. The first level of practice is control your body and speech, which is behavior which is the law of karma, then you start to control the mind, which is what drives the body and speech. So, okay. The negative states of mind or neurotic states of mind or non-virtuous states of mind or deluded states of mind or afflictions, all these different terms are broadly speaking synonymous. They're all the voices of ego, put it that way. So, the, so there's, there's thousands of these different unhappy neurotic states of mind, but Buddha very fortunately narrows them all down to three. It's very interesting. I mean, Ling Rinpoche, young Ling Rinpoche, the reincarnation of, the, of the, you know, the, His Holiness is Dalai Lama's root guru, Ling Rinpoche, and one of Lama's over, I mean, Yeshi's main gurus, who passed away in the 80s. He's now 30-something, the young Lama, and he's, you know, he travels around. Has he been to Australia yet? Does anyone know? Has Ling Rinpoche come to Australia yet? Yes, he has. Yeah. Um, um, Wonderful. Yeah, he was, he was supposed to come back again, but yeah, he's been to Perth and Sydney, I think. 
Oh, wonderful. Okay. So anyway, in a lot of his teachings, are, uh, people have said that they've heard this too for the first time. And for me, it was the first time I've ever heard it. It's very interesting. We might often hear in the teachings that Buddha talks about, we've got 84,000 distinct neurotic states of mind, this kind of vast map of the mind, you know? I mean, I keep asking people in the Geshe's where the text is that shows this, and no one ever knows. But they always talk about 84,000 neurotic states of mind, delusions. But he, but, and, and as Lingram, as, but he narrows them all down to these three. They're all subsumed to the three, which is really interesting. They sound on the face of it kind of simplistic, but it's quite profound if we can understand these three. So we've got ego grasping, or known as colloquial word for ignorance, maripa, the main delusion which clings to the separate sense of a neurotic dualistic me, the most primordial root delusion, on the basis of which we then have attachment to get what that fantasy me wants, on the basis of which we get anger or depression or, or worry or fear when it doesn't get what it wants. And these three are, on the face of it, simple, but are primordially deep and necessary to understand. Or as Lingua Bajay often says now, and as I said, I haven't heard this before, other people have said the same thing. The, the 21,000 of those 84,000 are directly rooted in ignorance, are di related directly to in their character. 21,000 are directly related to attachment. 21,000 are directly related to aversion or anger. And then the other fourth 21,000 rooted in all three. So it's a really quite specific model of the mind, quite unique. And what we're discussing here again is, remember, not the brain. And we're not even discussing here, se you know, the sensory consciousness yet. We're discussing the mental states. So it's our job is to distinguish between all these, but the, knowing just these three, which seem kind of cute, kind of on the face of it, is quite profound, you know? They're deeply ingrained and they go to subtle, subtle levels. And there's this very intimate relationship between them. Then we're talking the negative ones here. So they're ignorance, ego, known colloquially as ego grasping, the one that prim is primordial clinging at the depth of our being, so subtle, it's just an absolute given for all of us. We don't even notice it because it's so primordially pervasive in our minds. This is known as ego grasping colloquially and as ignorance, mahrigpa in Tibetan, unawareness. So what it is is this primordial unawareness of how everything, including the I, actually exists. But it's not just a simple unawareness. It's also another level of ignorance on top of it, like double trouble ignorance. So it's not only do we not know ultimately how things exist. Not only do we not know ultimately how things exist, we've actually made up, a, this ignorance has made up a complete fantasy, which is the direct opposite of the reality. So, the, so if we just had mere ignorance, which is not knowing, like, you know, we get enlightened in a couple of years, but that's not the problem. We've got this fantasy we've made up that's the exact opposite of reality that we've been clinging to for eons. We believe utterly there's a real self-existent, inherent, intrinsic, definite, solid, pointable me there and everything else there. And on the basis of this, we then have attachment in relation to oneself by this intense, unbelievable emotional hunger, this neurotic attachment to get what that supposed I wants. And that's the one that drives us overtly day to day. And this is kind of, even though it's, it's grosser than the ignorance, it too is incredibly subtle, incredibly primordial. It's there all the time. It's like at the level of assumption. And this assumption is that just I must get what I want every millisecond. So we've also got virtues. And like I said, that's out there, our saving grace. So the neurotic ones, they've got very specific um, way they function. They're, first of all, they, they're deeply, the, the, the experience of them is that they're deeply disturbing. So, you know, these three, or this, the ignorance and attachment and aversion, or attachment and anger, and then they give rise to all the others, like jealousy and arrogance and low self-esteem and all that rubbish. And they're all rooted in fear. Fear is their nature. Fear is their flavor. You can almost argue there's no one state of mind called fear in Buddhism. It pervades all the neuroses. In their nature, they're rooted. Their taste is fear. It seems very abstract to us, but why is because they're all liars. They're disturbing, but the real function of them is that they're delusional. They cause us to not be in touch with reality. This is such a specific thing. When we can get this, we can understand Buddha's view. It's quite profound, you know, but it's hard to see. All these neuroses, all these afflictions, all these delusions, all these misconceptions, all these emo disturbing emotions, they are misconceptions in their nature. They're, they're conceptions, 
their conceptual stories and their misconceptions. They lead us up garden paths. In other words, as Lama Zopa puts it, you know, the way the world appears out there, the world, the way the world appears back to us is in the aspect, is how they say in Buddhist psychology, of whatever is in our mind. So if your mind is full of attachment, there's this constant emotional hunger, this feeling of being bereft, of never having enough, always wanting something more. So we're looking at everything in terms of will, or, will, it, or, will it satisfy my needs or not? If you have always anger in your mind or aversion or depression, things will always look ghastly, awful, horrible. You want to push them away. So we run between these two like drunken sailors all day, you know, and that we don't talk like this in modern psychology, but it's quite profound the way Buddhism would describe it. And initially, of course, we look at it very simply, but as we progress spiritually, as we become more familiar with our own minds, we become deeper and more deeply and more deeply aware of these states of mind and how they run the show, basically. And all the others come from these. So in general, the very first level where Buddha gets us, exhorts us not to kill, steal, jump on the wrong partner. The first three of the body. The, first, the next four are speech. And of course, these are unique to humans. Don't say words that aren't true. Don't abuse people with your mouth. Don't rabbit on about nothing. And don't talk bad things about people behind their backs. Four things, very simple. You know, so what makes these actions negative is that they're driven by, let's face it, anger or attachment, pretty much, pretty much, anger or attachment. That's what gives them the character of being negative. And they leave seeds in the mind that will ripen in the four ways, as a type of rebirth, or a tendency to do it, or think it, as um, an experience of having it happen to you, and as an environmental result. Of course, like I said, initially, it seems very abstract to us, but it's all there to be understood in the literature. It's all there, you know, it's up to us. As we progress, we'll learn it more and more, as we understand things more and more deeply. So suffering then, the root cause of suffering is the delusions. Then the, ex the next one is the, the action the body and speech does that is like the servant of the mind that does the action of stealing, the action of killing, the action of abusing, the action of lying. Then you have the virtuous states of mind. Love, empathy. Like love, what is love? It's, it's, it's a conceptual state of mind as well. And it's a thought. When you see someone happy, you delight for their happiness. When you, you think of a person, you want them to be happy. That's called love. Compassion. You see a person suffering and you have empathy with their suffering. You don't want them to have it. That's called compassion. They're like the essence, if you like, of all the virtuous states of mind. So these states of mind are also conceptual at the level we exist now, at the dualistic level we function now. But they're virtuous. And why are they virtuous? Because they're in sync with reality. And this is a curious idea that anger and attachment are not in touch with reality. They're lies. Reality, in a simple sense, is everything is interdependent. Everything exists interdependently. So the virtues are more in touch with interdependence. But the delusions are completely out of whack. There's no sense of interdependence. So as Lama Zopa says, that whatever you know, appear, like I said, the way the world appears out there back to us is in the aspect of what's in our mind. So the mind is always angry. Things always look crooked and ugly and horrible and separate from you. If you're always attached, there's a sense of loneliness, always craving something. But if your mind is loving, there's a sense of connectedness, of harmony. Even if the world is really suffering and you've got lots of love and compassion, it doesn't distress you. You see it, but you have compassion for everybody. Yet there's a sense of connectedness with the world when you have the virtues. There's a sense of separateness from the world when you have the delusions. It's very clear. So in themselves, right there, the having of them, the delusions, they cause you suffering. And in themselves, right there, having the virtues cause you to be happy, right there. But when they, drive it, when they drive the actions we do, then that's when they sow the seeds in the mind that program our mind in those tendencies, program our mind in those habits. So, you know, that's it. It's a very natural process. And got, it's a natural process. No one runs it. No one makes it happen. No one says, see, you do it. My Catholic mother used to say, virtue has its own rewards. That's what Buddha is saying about everything. Non-virtuous actions bring their own non-rewards and virtuous actions bring their own rewards. You don't need to be seen to be virtuous for the results to happen. You don't need to see, you don't see your doctor doesn't have to see you smoke for it to give you cancer. You, you don't have to be seen to lie in order for it to program your mind with suffering. 
It's a very natural process. And this brings a huge, when we start to learn this way, understand the delusions in the, in the model of the mind, and then understand the actions that drive them, and then learn to refrain from those actions and eventually start to work on the mind. This is the essence of daily Buddhist practice. This is Buddhist practice. Not just sitting there looking holy, watching your breath, not sitting there looking like 14th century nun's robes, not sitting there with your hands like this at the Buddha, not doing your mantras. They're all necessary, but the heart practice is working on your mind, controlling your body, your speech, and your mind. That's it. This is the bottom line of Buddhist practice. So, we have sensory consciousness, like I said, sensory consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, tactile tongue and nose, five senses. And because we mostly identify with being this body and we mostly make the body the boss because we think it's me and we, and we give them all this power to our sensory experiences, and when, so when our senses meet their appropriate object, when the cake meets the tongue, when the, when the weather, when the sun meets the skin, when the handsome person meets the eye consciousness and it triggers, it does in fact, yes, it does in fact trigger a happy feeling. So what's happiness? Finally, happiness and suffering are not physical things. This is very interesting. They're states of mind. So in the third category of states of mind, that I like to call the mechanics, there's, there's many in there like concentration, good memory, discrimination. There's many in the Buddhist model and they're simple words that we all use, but they're understood in a very specific way. And one needs to become familiar with them, especially when you start to learn to meditate, when you grow these states of mind, because we need these to function properly. But uh, whether you're a murderer or a meditator, you need concentration, you need good memory, you need discrimination, you need attention, you need intention. They're not virtuous or, or non-virtuous in their character. That's why they're known as neutral, not, not important, but not having those particular characteristics. They don't have those characteristics. They're very specifically got this function. And whether you're, like I said, a murderer or a meditator, you need these states of mind. And the Buddhist view, and this again comes from these Indians 3,000 years ago, there's a very incredible, sophisticated understanding of these states of mind. And again, remember, we're not discussing neuroscience here, not insulting neuroscience. We're discussing the actual cognitive process itself. So it's an incredibly detailed and quite, you know, got breadth and depth, this view of the mind that eventually, if you really want to be a serious practitioner, you need to study it. You can't just say, oh yeah, I feel a bit of attachment. You can't know what the hell it is, you know? And I know how to identify it. That's why we have to have concentration. We have to learn these things so we can become our own therapist, unpack and unravel and deconstruct this internal process of our own mind. You know? This is the real job of being a Buddhist. So of course you can't do that until you control your body and speech. If you want to jump on every boy you like and eat every piece of cake you see and shout every word you feel, you're never going to see your mind in a million years because it's too late. Because you're just, you know, you're just buying into all the servants. So that's why the first level of practice is called discipline but for a logical reason to protect you from suffering. Not because someone said so, not because you're going to seem to be a nice girl or something. Not that kind of silly ideas. No, it's really fundamental. It's for your benefit. You're the beneficiary of this. Then you can do the real job of knowing your mind. So, okay, happiness. A moment of happiness is a, mental, is a state, both sensory and mental. You can experience happy feelings in your body. It's clear. It's, but the mind feels them, not the body. This is the point. The body is not the mind, and the mind is not the body for Buddha. Very clear. They're distinctly different, but they're utterly intimate, inextricably linked. So a happy so in that in those categories of all those other states of mind, the third lot, one that's in there is called feeling. Not in the way we understand as an emotion. It's, it's, it's one of the, the, these so-called neutral states, neither negative nor positive. Feeling. And there's only three kinds of feeling. There are those that are called happy there are, or pleasant. There are those that are called unpleasant or suffering. And there are those that are called neither. So indifferent. So let's forget those ones. Let's forget those for now because we're more concerned with the happy and the suffering. We do not want the suffering ones and we do want the happy ones. So every second of the day, there is a, some kind of feeling or other, both mental and sensory. So, of course, the natural logic for us, because we're very sensory beings, we've got this big bag of bones here that really does run the show. We know we've also got thoughts and feelings and emotions, but we don't pay much attention until they're shouting. This is not our culture, you know. So we know with the physical, it's the first level, isn't it? The first level experience is physical. So then naturally, we th when we, we eat the cake, we put the cake in the mouth, it triggers a pleasant feeling. 
So naturally, logically, we think the main cause of that pleasant feeling is a piece of cake. So you eat it again. Now, Buddha doesn't argue that there wasn't a pleasant feeling, and he doesn't argue that the chocolate cake doesn't play a role, but he's saying, he, what he's saying is we don't have enough deep understanding of it, but that's just merely the catalyst. The cake is merely the trigger. The cake is the catalyst. In the same way, for example, let's say you have an allergy to peanuts. The meeting of the peanut in your mouth, the peanut is merely the catalyst that triggers an unpleasant feeling. But what is the cause then of the unpleasant feeling? What is the, the main cause of the unpleasant feeling? And the main cause of the pleasant feeling, this is the karmic exploration. So every millisecond of any virtuous action, so for example, any, any, any millisecond of conscious intentional non-killing that puts seeds into your bank vault, if you like, they're going to ripen, like I said, eventually in four ways. One, the major way that non-killing will ripen in your main bank vault is at, when you get, when you get, you know, at the time of your death. These, these seeds are triggered at the time of your death. The virtuous karma, the main virtuous karmic seed of a complete positive action of non-killing will then, in our case, each one of us being human now, was triggered at the time we passed away in the past life, not more than seven weeks before we found our way to our mummy's fallopian tube. And that was triggered before we stopped breathing. It's very precise. And that already programmed us to go to our present mother's human fallopian tube a few weeks later. Already programmed. They did not create you. The mother and father are lying there having sex and you come barging in, baby. Do not blame them, okay? You've got this karmic connection, that's how the Buddhists would say, and it's your past killing karma that was triggered before you stopped breathing in the past life, a few weeks before conception, that programmed you right there to go to your present mother's human womb, or the fallopian tube, wherever it went. So, what happened there? I went from there to feeling. Something got disconnected. I lost the plot. I got. I don't know why I got there. I'm sorry. I need an editor in my head. Now, where the positive feeling comes from? Okay. Thank you. Very good. This is a really. This is a really fascinating point. Okay. 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 I use it. Always use the example. It's a really nice example. I mean, it's a suffering example of a of this woman. I always quote this story. It must be a thousand times I've told this story in the last thirty years, but I'll tell it again. It's a good example. Years and years ago in Copan in the nineties. Maybe that's not quite thirty years yet. Um, this woman came to my room in tears. She'd never heard the Buddhist teachings before. And I've, I've seen her since, and she's not a Buddhist, but this is a bit of experience she had. But her boy was 20, had died five years before he was 29. He was a scuba diver all his life. And he was a, a fisherman all his life. And he and scuba diving, whatever, whatever. So she talked about him, and she was a lovely boy, she said. But from the time he was tiny, he, from the time he first met fishing, it's like he fell in love with fishing and he became a fisherman. He identified as a fisherman. He called himself a fisherman. That completely drove his life, you know? He became a fisherman. So she was hearing Lama Zopa talk about karma and how the, some of those suffering results of, of killing were like born in the lower realms and this kind of thing as, as, not, as not a human, for example. And she was devastated. She'd never heard this before. And she came in tears to my room and said, where has he been reborn? Because he died five years before that scuba diving. I said, I don't have any idea, but why don't you go and talk to Geshe Lama Contra, this amazing yogi Lama we have who passed away in 2001. I said, because he said to me, you know, great yogi, clairvoyant, compassion, bodhicitta, all the business, blah, 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 you know, fully qualified. So I said, ask him. And these lamas never very rarely tell you what they see. And these lamas, by the way, as I said before, clairvoyance is not just some hippie trippy thing that happens occasionally. It is a natural function of mind as we progress. And certainly when we get single point of concentration and access these subtle levels of our own cognition. This is fitting completely with this Buddha's view and has been around before with the Indians. It's all there in the literature, you know? Of course, not in our model, of course not. You can explain new idea to us. So this holy being is amazing holy lama. So she went to see him. And uh, she went to see him to find to, to where her son was reborn. Anyway, the point is this, before we go into details. Before, the point is this, this is what happens. This is the technology of it. There he is, due to past killing, due to lots of other things. He, first of all, his first, first type of karma, he got a human body. That means it's due to non-killing. There's millions of karmic seeds, all different kinds. And they're not they're just one, it's not a single, it's not a single thing. There's millions of different karmic seeds that manifest in all in different ways. So he got, a, he got a human rebirth and he got a really nice human rebirth. People loved him. He was born in Northern California. He had a nice mummy and a good experience. good environmental karma. All the, tick the boxes of all the good karmic results. Lots of them. He got that. Then, then, but secondly, in his mind, he had lots of good tendencies. He was kind and generous and intelligent and loving, but he had a tendency to kill. Now that's normal in our world, isn't it? We don't think twice about that. 
killing humans maybe, but killing rats and killing fish and killing cockroaches, we don't think that's a problem, you know. Killing poodles maybe because we're attached to poodles. It just shows how arbitrary we are, you know. I mean, in the Philippines, they eat dogs. You go to prison if you ate a dog in America or Australia. We called a monster. We put on death row. So it shows how arbitrary we are. It shows how it's related to attachment, isn't it? So anyway, he had a tendency to kill. Because how did she know that? He didn't, she didn't know that until he met fishing. And that's the thing about the condition. The condition is the one that triggers the seed that's there. But the seed was latent. So he had, he had a tendency to kill. So as soon as he met fishing, he like instantly fell in love with fishing. So what's going on? This is the point now I'm trying to describe, the technology of it. There's a tendency in his mind to kill. It doesn't ripen until he meets the condition, called, in this case called fishing. He didn't kill his mum. He didn't want to kill the rats. He, you know, he had the tendency to kill fish. So he meets fishing instantaneously. What happens is this. The karmic seed is there. The habit is there, the tendency, which is now instantly triggered by this environment called fishing. It's like, it's like a memory. And we have this experience. We meet certain people. You know, we meet certain people. It's as if we've known them all our lives. This karmic connection. We've got karmic connections with activities. We, that's why we like certain things. So we don't like certain things. It's because of the tendency in our mind from before. So he sees the fishing. It's like instantly, it, what it does instantaneously because of the strength of the habit of his past killing. To that degree, it triggers a very delicious feeling in his mind a delicious feeling of happiness, happiness. The next millisecond, attachment takes over. And what I haven't discussed attachment much, but what attachment does is key function. It's, it over-exaggerates the deliciousness of something. So you're, when you're attached to chocolate cake, we know it looks divine. When you have a version for chocolate cake, it looks disgusting. So one of the key functions of all these delusions, all the neurotic states of mind, all the afflictions as they call them, all the, all the, the, the delusions, these, these unhappy states of mind, their key function, one is they're disturbing, but two, they exaggerate, they embellish. The more strong the attachment, the more divine that boy looks. The more strong the attachment, the more delicious the, 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 the cake looks. And in his case, because of the habit to kill, the more delicious the fishing appeared to him. It appeared delicious. So one, the karmic tendency was there. He meets the condition instantaneously. Very pleasant feelings are triggered very pleasant feelings. So of course, he has no view of karma. He doesn't understand any past life. He doesn't have that view. So what naturally, because the, the fishing is right there and he ha feels happy when he sees it, the logic is naturally he deduces fishing is the cause of happiness. But the next second attachment paints a picture in his mind of fishing and being totally divine. And it leaves a very strong impression in his mind. So naturally, he assumes the fishing is the cause of the happy feelings, just like we think the cake is, called, is the cause of the happy feelings. But no, fishing is a mere catalyst for the happy feelings. The, eating the cake, the cake is a mere catalyst for the happy feelings. The happy, each happy feeling, each moment, many, as many seconds as you can think of, as many microseconds of moments of happiness, each of those seconds of happiness is a fruit of an action that's virtuous in the past. And that's all the tragedy when you, you know, um, follow, because we assume the fishing. Like, I mean, my friend on death row in Kentucky who thinks of torture all the time, we can deduce he's got a strong tendency from God knows what lifetime, it could have been as an animal, a strong tendency to want to harm. And why does he think of it all the time? Because it gives pleasure. Because we can't, that's, that's what attachment does. Attachment thinks of the object all the time. It thinks of the thing you want all the time. And like I said, look at apathetic habits of eating too much cake. But if you're attached to sex, you think of the boy all the time. If you're attached to fishing, you think of the fishing all the time. So, and of course, because in our culture, fishing is seen as a good thing to do. No one thinks, worries about the fish. Few people these days worry about the fish. But in general, it's part of our culture. It, it looks benign. You know, fish don't shout and yell. Fish don't have legs that they can leap into the boats unless they're crabs or lobsters that have got to tie them up. Fish don't shout. Their eyes, you know, the fish's little eyes just stay the same. The best they can do is wriggle their body and show their discomfort. They want to be in the water, please. It's pretty evident. But this is the worst tragedy of attachment to harming sentient beings is attachment makes it look delicious, which means you're as blind as a bat and you can't see the suffering that that fish is experiencing at that moment. 
This is what's so intense. So, you know, that's a human being with attachment to killing. He can't see the suffering of the fish. What he sees is pleasant. He thinks of the weather and how lovely it is and the feelings are triggering him and nice feelings. He doesn't, you know, but they come from the habit of killing. The more strong the habit to kill, the more, the more intense the connection with the action is and the more triggered, the, the more pleasant the feelings and the more strong the attachment. And so, of course, you're locked into that because that's what we think of as happiness. Cake makes happiness. You know, the boy causes me happiness. Happiness. The money causes me happiness. The pleasant, the pleasant objects call me happiness. This is what Buddha would call a samsaric view. He's, he's not being kind of punitive. He's not being negative. He's just saying we've got the wrong analysis. So to give attachment up and stopping doing the things we want to do that we are convinced will cause us happiness, and they do trigger pleasant feelings. There's not a lie there, but they're not the main cause. This is why practice is so hard. And until we start working on our mind in this way, we're not practicing. You can sit there every day and watch your breath and feel very nice. You can sit there and be a holy person, say your mantras. You're not practicing until you work with your delusions and, ref and learn to understand them and change them. This is why practice is so hard. So in other words, we're completely misled. We've got a complete analysis, Buddha say, where there's a totally misconception. The analysis we have of what happiness is and what suffering is. The feeling is pleasure when he went fishing. The feeling when you put the cake in the mouth is pleasure. He's not arguing with that. But it said it's, it's based upon the wrong logic and based upon the wrong motivations, based on giving attachment what it wants. And because attachment is a bottomless pit, it can never get happy. Its nature is to be dissatisfied. So the irony is not only do, does getting the cake not causes, not causes happiness, it does cause happiness, but it doesn't last because you've got to eat the cake again. Second thing is, you know, it does cause happy feelings, but naturally because we think the cake will cause more happy feelings, so we put a second mouthful in them. We put a third mouthful, a fourth mouthful, a second piece, a third piece. And what we're doing is we're keeping waiting for the happiness to come, but we never have enough. Attachment is bottomless pit. It can never get enough. So you, you put one piece in. Oh, that was so delicious. I must have another piece. I'll get more happy. But no, from the first mouthful, so that's the best one, it goes downhill from there. This is a technical thing we have to observe. It's not punitive. It's not saying you shouldn't have happiness. Buddha is just saying we've got the wrong end of the stick. So not only does it not bring lasting happiness, it doesn't last. Not only that, it actually inexorably turns into disgust. If you keep eating that cake and you're looking for happiness, at some point you will suddenly be shocked because now you're going to vomit if you eat the next mouthful. And now how does the cake look? Completely disgusting. It looks so divine before you couldn't resist it. And now it's repulsive. I mean, you get that fisherman to be out there for 24 hours a day, day after day after day going fishing, he would die of exhaustion and disgust. You've got to have a break when you do it again. And thinking next time I'll go fishing, it might make me happy. Next time I'll eat the cake, I might get happy. No, it not only doesn't bring you happiness, it actually causes aversion and it, it grows the habit to become more dissatisfied. As my mother used to say when I was a kid, and I'd think and think about it, but I was attached to food. I am attached to food. She said, the more you get, the more you want. I mean, this is the essence of the suffering of attachment. That's what we call addiction. Well, Buddha says addiction is a great word for attachment. That's it. It says we're all junkies, he says. It's just a question of degree and a question of the object. And this is what he means by samsara. So it's a technical thing. And this quite, it's, it's, it's not how we think. It's not the analysis we use at all. So we don't understand this. We don't know what Buddha's talking about. You know, we just hear it as punitive. He doesn't want us to make us, he wants us to give up attachment and sex and drugs and rock and roll and be miserable. No. Actually, the point he's making is he's saying, hey guys, I found a method that will call that is the cause of happiness. And what he means by happiness is happy feelings. And what is the main cause of happy feelings? Virtue. Not now, it's painful, but in long term. And what he is saying is, anyway, and this is where it's marvelous to hear about the nature of mind. Like in Lama Yeshi's wonderful book, Mahamudra, you know, where he talks about the nature of mind. There's really, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marvelous teaching on meditating on the true nature of our own mind, how to discover our true nature, how to realize the emptiness of our mind, how to realize non-duality. It's a beautiful teaching. And he talks a lot there about the way they describe in Buddhist psychology, the way the mind functions, what it is, and it's in its bones, you know. So mind is cognition. It's mental and it's sensory, but we've, it's got this marvelous potential that the nature, okay, the nature of our mind, such that when we have removed the delusions from it, when we've given up ego grasping and attachment and aversion, and that's the hard work, what's left is the virtues and what's left is joy and bliss, bliss and joy. And don't think this is being funny. It's quite literal. 
is the natural state of our mind when it's unencumbered by the neuroses. It's a technical thing. And, and that's, how, that's what really Buddha is saying. He says, hey, guys, I found a method to get happy. And that happiness, those joyful feelings, the Buddha say, are in the nature of our mind. When our mind is, even just when our mind is virtuous, forget what our mind is also realized emptiness, just when our mind is virtuous, when our mind is more loving and patient and kind, it is more joyful. Naturally, this is a logical relationship. We can learn from our own experience, that's true. The more anger, the more attachment, the more jealousy, the more aversion, the more nightmare. It's the nature of those states of mind. But our, yeah, so the, this, so the Buddhist view is very powerful in saying what our mind really is. And this is how we learn to find happiness. He says it's internal. Then you can have your cake and eat it too, because you're now given up attachment. So you don't become miserable by giving up attachment. You become happy. Actual happiness, the Buddha says, is stable that doesn't turn into suffering. The happiness we have now is short-lived. And it's, it kind of sounds depressing in a way because we don't know any other method. We don't know any other way to get happiness except to eat cake and have boys, isn't it, really? To have a nice sensory experience. That's it. That's all we know. That's all we know. So it's kind of intense to think that's not the main cause of happiness. Buddha says our mind has the potential to be joyful to be clear, to be joyful, to be unneurotic. That's what happiness is. That's what happiness is. That's what Buddha's saying. Then you, when you have, when you only have to some degree even, subdued your body, speech and mind, learn to have discipline, given up attachment and anger to some degree, even to some degree, you can see that your mind is more stable and more happy and, because you, 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 you've harnessed it, you know. We can experience the truth of that ourselves. You know, you know some people, no matter how poor they are or even sick, if they've got happy mind, they're not so neurotic, they're not so attached, they're not so anxious, anxious they're not so jealous, they're not so paranoid, they're happy. That's because their mind is virtuous, meaning loving, empathetic, kind, forgiving, generous. These are the source of happiness. And these are the core, these are the core of our being, what I'm saying. Any questions? We've got to talk about karma yet. We've got to talk about more about karma yet. We've got two more days. We've got lots of time. So any more questions about what I've just discussed now? Yes, Francis. Francis has a question. Unmute, Francis. Can she unmute herself, Amy? Good. Unmute yourself, babe. Can you hear me? Good. Yes, we can. I can hear you. Good. Talk to me. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I wondered... Um, just talking about life when we were younger and we were maybe cruel to people and we jumped on our best friend's boyfriend and whatever and whatever, whatever. Yeah. is it ever too late? Is that's it what purification is. That's what purification is, Francis, which I'm going back to talk about. Right. That's why, that's why this process, the very first level of practice is to abide by the laws of karma and, and refrain now from doing the actions. The next level of practice, and I've left over a bit, I'm talking about the mind here, but in the first level of practice, first you control, first you stop sowing more weeds in the garden, but second, you've got to put atomic bombs under the seeds we've already planted so they don't ripen as our own future suffering. That's called purification, and that's what we're going to, that's the essence of the talk we're giving in this three days. And there's no oh, karma, we can't purify. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no time with this. That's we're gonna, we're gonna discuss that. Absolutely. Good, darling. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Bina. Any more questions, people? Yes, Maria. Yes, Maria. Rubina, lovely to see oh, you. Um, yes. Uh, I'm now back in Australia, living. Good. No more. When did you back? Uh, a year and a half ago. Oh, okay, right. So I have a house here, um, but my cousin's husband passed away a year and a half ago. He was 52 years old. Yes. She's just about to turn 50. She's still absolutely devastated, and she has oh, a nine-year-old daughter. Yes. Both suffering very badly, and she comes up with some pretty kooky and wild ideas about where he is, what's happening to him, um and i don't want to say anything negative to her and i don't okay. know how to support her she you knows she'll say oh he's going to be you know he's in heaven one day she'll say he's in heaven the next day mm -hmm. she says oh he's going to be a buddhist monk in his next life you know and all this sort of stuff okay, okay. and okay. i yeah really tough to support her um yes. and i don't want to tell her the truth 
What do you mean by tell her the truth? Well, tell her the truth. What I understand is karma, that his karma is that he died young. Um, so I just don't say anything. Well, you don't need to. I mean, that's where, you know, that's where, that's where, this, this is now the compassion wing, isn't it, Maria? How to help people. Yeah. So let's say you're an oncologist and I've, and I've come to you full of fear and terror about my cancer. And you're the one who knows what the cancer is and how it came and you know all the logic of it. I don't, I don't need you to give me the logic. I don't need you to tell me the truth about what cancer is. I couldn't care less. I just need you to help me. So, you know, I need your advice about how to help me, how to subdue the cancer, how to cure it, or how to learn to live with it if I can't cure it. So, mm -hmm. and if you, and I can't hear your advice, then what you can do, Maria, is give her lots of love. Yeah. That's it. You can't yeah. change her. You, you can just give her lots of love. Don't try to tell her any truth. Because it's all a question of the person. If I come to you with my cancer, and I'm very down to earth and, about, and relaxed about it, and I'm dying to know about the cancer, and I'll ask you how it exists and how it happens, I'll be fascinated, and you'll be able to tell me. So that's where compassion has to be the feeling of wanting to help somebody, but it's wisdom that gives us the ability to know how to help. So if you can't say much to your friend, if you can't talk about impermanence and talk about how death is natural and we all die and we're going to die soon, I mean, if she's not open to any conversation, but that's up to you and the skill you have got to know where her mind is at in order for you to know how you can help her. And if you don't know how to help her, just give her love and let her just chat away. So it's not, it, it's not, bad karma to not say anything oh god almighty it's just, it's, just, it's a question of being sensible yeah you know if i'm oh you know if i'm sick because i'm eating too much sugar but i just can't bear to hear it what's the point of you telling me you're just going to bash my head against a brick wall you have to know how where i'm at so you know how to help me so sometimes we can't help anybody and so what we've also got to do maria is look at our own you know this is where we can this is a very interesting point too about the compassion wing you see, compassion is empathy with someone's suffering. But wisdom, it's wisdom that understands their mind that enables us to know how to help them. So if you don't have enough wisdom to know how to help her, and that also, you see, the thing is also we can't always help somebody. And what we mean by help, Maria, is you want her to change. So this is where sometimes our wish to help, and you have to know your own mind here, I'm not talking about you personally, but our wish to help somebody is often driven by our own wish they bloody will change because we're sick of them moaning. In other words, our attachment is not happy. Our attachment would wish they'd rather stop all this misery. We are, you see, attachment is a junkie that only wants everything to be lovely. So the neurotic part of a person, the neurotic part of my attachment, let's say you come to me with your misery, the neurotic part of my attachment doesn't like your misery because it makes me unhappy. But, and then I've, I've also, I've got compassion for you. So then because of my attachment to make you change, I kind of look like I'm trying to help you, but I just manipulate you. That's not useful. So you've got to learn if you can help her change and help her to understand impermanence. Forget about karma. Just understand that death is natural. Everyone's going to die. You're going to die. Your child's going to die. So when we learn to realize that things are impermanent, we become more realistic. So if you can't help her learn this at least, just love her for who she is and don't expect her to change. No. That's the point. Yeah, That's we, had, we, we did have that conversation the other night and um, she yeah. doesn't want to talk about it. So I just... What do you mean talk about? Talk about what? Uh, talk about death. Okay, so then you, that's clearly you can't help it that way. So yeah, she doesn't want to celebrate her 50th yeah. birthday because her daughter doesn't want her to get old because getting old means you're going to die. That's right. So then if you can't cope with that, I mean, you have, you, they're very, a close part of your life. You see them every day or once a week or what? Oh, I see her often and speak to her most every day. Oh, she rings you or you ring her? Both. Both. But she's yeah. your friend. No, you love her. cousin. Cousin. I know, but she's still a friend. She's your friend. Yes. You love her. Yes. Okay. Yes. You just have to find the way to be happy and loving and to, and to yeah. feed back her good things and to, and to sort of be optimistic. But don't try to change her. Don't try to manipulate her. And don't get stressed out about her. Let her be who she is. Yeah. Absolutely. And if it's trying to go on, oh, sometimes you've got to, that's where you also wisdom comes in, Maria. If she's really suffering and never stops talking about it, ever, ever stops talking about it, sometimes there's not benefit in her talking. You just got to say, oh, sorry, darling, I've got to go now, you know? So you've got to be wise, but it's always got to come from the right place. Yeah, lovely. Awesome. And it's not easy. And this is where we always, we've all got people in our lives, we think they should be different. We can see their problem and they can't see it. We're all like that. But that's, that's our problem half the time. Let people be, you know, let them be. If we can't help them, let them be. And mm. love them for who they are. That's the best help to give. Okay, thank you. You understand, Maria? Yes. Good to right. you. That's a really important point. It's a common one for all of us, you know. Anyone else? 
Any other questions? And what that means, Maria, is that we want to look at our own attachment. You see, attachment is this junky in us that only wants everything to be nice. And that's a neurotic part of us. And that often what we what we that attachment often pollutes our compassion and ends up like especially if it's our mum or somebody, you know, like your mum always wants you to be different, or your boy or our husband always wanted you to be different. If only he'd give up drinking, if only it'd be this way. And we think, oh, you know, and we think it's called loving him, but all the time wishing he'd change, wanting him to be different. This is very powerful for all of our minds. And that's our attachment. And that's neurotic. So not being passive, if there is something you can do to help a person, but we're always seeing someone else's problems all the time. But we've got to recognize that's just human beings. And then also we've got to reflect it back to ourselves and realize, okay, then that's my attachment, my wish that they'd be different. But that's the part that often makes us in especially when it's families, we get very upset with each other, you know? And we talk about them behind their back and that kind of thing. We've just got to let it be and learn to be content with how that person is. And if they change, fantastic. If, if we can help them, fantastic. But if not, love them for who they are. This is very, sounds very simple, but it's really pretty profound. I mean, look at the, most relationships, how they go crazy because we're all trying to change each other because our attachment doesn't like the way the partner is. You understand? It's very interesting. What else? Any more in the notes, Amy? No. Yes, Christina, good darling, talk. Um, I just have a question. Um, oh, hello, Evan. Yes, Christina, happy to see you, darling. I'm good, thanks. Um, good. So with attachment, um, in terms of our tendencies, if we recognize, um, like if we can actually sense the thoughts coming um, and focusing on an object like chocolate cake or something, and we know we actually, it's not even to make us happy, but we just can't stop thinking about it. Um, is it that we reframe it in that moment to reduce the attachment? Because I mean, it's a tendency, it's, it's kind of like it's there. It kind of goes away for a while and then it just returns. And of course, because the habit's so strong. It's just, it's just like reverberations in the mind. It's beyond, I mean, intention is there, but because it's so primordial and so habitual, like that friend on death row thinking of torture all the time. We look into our minds, we can see that we're always busily looking for something to think about, looking for something to make us excited. So if it's, you know, it's the food or it's the job, or it's, that's why we get dissatisfied because we can't think of something to excite us. So the mind is always grasping at something to get excited about. So if there's something we're attached to, beyond, almost like it feels like it's beyond volition, it's because the reverberation is so strong, it's just there. The habit is just there. That's why the very first level of practice is at least don't put the hand out for the cake control them have the hand that's already profound but your, your mind's still going to go crazy and until we've really quite advanced those thoughts are going to be there but then the next level of practice when we start to really understand our mind we instead of being stressed out about it and freaked out and i shouldn't be this way and try to make it all go away that kind of thing we should just let it be there that's why i like to use the analogy of your roommates it's a really good analogy what these thousands of thoughts we know that and we're not conscious of 99 percent of them because they're all chatting away while we're busy doing our work busy driving the car and then always just there but the strong ones the, the attachment ones that say the boyfriend you're in love with who doesn't love you anymore or the person you're angry with they're raging at the front of our mind aren't they and we can't stop no matter what we're doing it might not be evident to anybody else but you're sitting there in the cafe talking about the weather and you're thinking about your boyfriend we know this this is just the uncontrolled habit of attachment thoughts so that part of this the practice here what happens is, you see, they say, even at the very the way they say it in the text, when you start to learn single point of concentration, which is when you really start to focus your mind and really start to see your mind, they say one of the signs of success at the first of the nine stages, as we know it's described in terms of nine stages of cultivating this concentration, the sign of success at the first of the nine is that you think your mind's getting worse. So because here we're now starting to work on our minds and do our meditation, we, one of the commonest things is we think our mind is worse than it was. No, we just never noticed before. We just never noticed what was going on before. So, the, so, to, so then it, well, it's a good sign that you're seeing the thoughts that are there, but our problem is because we then think, oh, I shouldn't be angry or I shouldn't be thinking of attachment or I shouldn't be like this. We start to beat ourselves up. So we keep adding these new negative roommates, anger about being angry and angry about being jealous and angry about being attached. But what we've got to learn to do is give less power to those thoughts. You can't force them away. That's where one of the major misconceptions about mindfulness meditation is to make all the thoughts go away. We think of it as like an alternative to a pill. That's really naive. These thoughts are very powerful. They're very ancient. They're very habitual. So the real next level of practice is recognize they're there. 
but not buy into them. Let them be like a bunch of loud roommates next door, all shouting and yelling. Instead of resisting them and shouting and wishing they weren't there or making them go away, you just learn to accept that they're there. This is super powerful level of practice. So you're conscious, the wisdom, so you've got good roommates, got wisdom and clarity and intelligence and kindness. All your good roommates should be really proactive here. They're, they're, they're your intelligence is observing the crazy thoughts and your intelligence is kind of subduing you, having an argument. Okay, Christina, anger's there, attachment's there. It's just old habit. Let it be there. It's okay. I can, I can handle it. Instead of having fear of it, wishing it wasn't there and trying to make it go away. That's the real torture. So that's a profound level of development when we start to do that. And then by not buying into them, they, be, they will eventually get weak. But as soon as we buy into them and have all the conversation or resist them or push them away, that causes all the stress and the drama. They're just thoughts. In the end, they're just thoughts. Do you understand? Yep. Yeah, I understand. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. It does. It's just, yeah. Because when Go it, like, oh, it's just that when, when, even when we sit to be quiet, you can recognize like where the focus is, where the awareness is, where the, and then the, and then I can just feel this attached. Like I can feel like the thought there. Yeah, the thought there. <laughs> That's right. They're there. So then what's the point? So what's the question? Um, well, yeah, I guess you answered it. You were just okay. acknowledged that it's Let there. Them there. Let them be there. Don't be surprised by them. Let them be there. Let them be there. That's the really powerful next step. Then we give them less power. But our trouble is we give thought, all our thoughts so much power. And that's literally why we go mad. Mm, yeah, I sometimes so like I reach out for the cake, though, and eat it, like, after you know what? that you couldn't. Sorry, what? Well... I mean, is giving power, like kind of um, submitting yourself? The first level, Christina, the first level of practice is don't put the hand on the cake. That already takes stupendous discipline and mental strength. So you're using your mind to control your body and speech. That's your first level. So when you get discipline and you've trained your mind to notice, and you, you, at least you leave your hand in the lap, the mind still berserk and wants the cake. That, that's got to come second, how you begin to do that. So it takes time. Okay. It demands discipline every minute. And, you know, and it's like not to be punitive with ourselves, not to put ourselves down, but just to be conscious. And this, this ability to see our minds get ever more sophisticated, ever more subtle. And the, the minds, we become more spacious about it. And then we proactively develop the positive ones. We tend to be a bit like a lemmings, you know, a bit like a victim, like a pup, like we're on a pup, we're sort of being pulled by a, a puppeteer. As if we, we see, all we do is see all the bad thoughts, but we never recognize that we can have good thoughts. We can decide to have a good thought. You can say a positive thought to yourself. But we just let, allow the thoughts to come and dominate us. We just think we're this victim of our thoughts but we can have proactively good thoughts you you, you say you say to yourself it's just attachment look at it and you hear it you hear you've got to hear it you've got to analyze it really deeply and well hear how precise it is you've got to observe it like you know with your microscope that's wisdom and then you have positive thoughts you recognize it's only a thought doesn't matter i can handle it it's okay it'll pass don't worry about it we talk to yourself all the time. You have positive thoughts. You bring the, I always think of the, the, the crazy roommates, the negative ones running the house and the good roommates are under the, under the, in the wardrobe and under the bed. Bring them out, baby. And they can start to fill your mind. Have positive thoughts, rejoicing in your practice, delighting. I mean, we don't ever think about positive thoughts. You know, I've never heard yet a person say, oh, I've got so many positive thoughts. I can't think, stop thinking of positive thoughts. Do you understand? So don't just try to struggle with the negative ones all the time. Bring up some positive ones. That'll calm your mind down. And move forward. Do you understand? Yeah, thanks, Venerable Rabina. Good, good, good. Who else? Uh, Venerable Rabina, just a comment from Julie. She says, You are amazing, Venerable Rabina. Your wisdom is pure medicine. Oh, good. I'm very happy. <laughs> it's channeling from Buddha behind me, okay? I'm very pleased. That's good, Julie. I'm wonderful. So, what else, you people? Anybody? Questions? Anyone? Something? Please? No? No questions? Well, then we should now then have a minute, have a two, three minute break and we'll have one more hour. Then we'll go into the purification practice itself, I think. Now we'll talk more about karma first, more how we create karma. Maybe we'll do purification tomorrow. So we'll discuss, okay? We'll do have a five minute break. All right? Five minutes. See you in five minutes. Thank you, Jennifer.